Hello, everybody, and welcome to the over 600 people we currently have online for this MHPN webinar tonight, Borderline Personality Disorder, Translating Evidence into Practice. Great to have you all with us. We've got a fabulous panel tonight, and I think we're going to have some really interesting conversations. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So my name's Steve Trumbull and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a GP by training in uh, metro, rural and remote settings at various times and a professor of medical education at the Melbourne Medical School. Before we meet the panel, um, I would like to just remind people that the purpose of the webinar tonight is to give health professionals the skills they need um, so uh, they can help people more effectively in future. There'll be personal stories of illness tonight, which are very important, and MHPN often includes consumers and carers on our panels, as we have tonight. The chat box, uh, however, is not a forum for personal stories. It's designed to complement the panel discussion by allowing professionals to share resources, experience, and thoughts during the webinar, but it's not a place for people to post personal experiences. So thank you for respecting that. If there's any content in tonight's webinar that causes us to stress, please do seek care if you require it via Beyond Blue uh, on 1300 224636 or contact your GP or other local mental health service. So here's tonight's panel. Um, and the bios were disseminated with the webinar invitation. So in the interest of ensuring we get through as much content as possible, I'm going to skip over those bios and presume you've read it. The first person we'll be hearing from tonight is Sophie Lucas, who's in New South Wales and a peer worker, educator, lived experience. Sophie, it's always fabulous to have somebody with lived experience on the panel uh, as an expert tonight. Um, so what is it that inspires you to do the work that you do? Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, I guess I do the work that I do because I feel like I've missed out on a lot of great care that could have happened, like from, you know, hearing someone else who's gone through similar, I guess, mental health journeys that I've been on and... I think that would have really helped me, especially when I was younger. Um, yeah, I've been living with mental illness since a very young age. And yeah, I lived experience stories was something I didn't know about till years after my first diagnosis. So that's why I do peer work to share my story and to inspire hope to others. And also to help anyone in a professional way, like this is what it's like on the receiving end of treatment. Fabulous. Thank you so much. So what you contribute tonight will help others, and that's all about paying it forward. So it's fabulous to have you. We also have on the panel Dr. Diana Bartsch from South Australia. Now, Diana, you're a clinical psychologist by background, but your real role here tonight is to introduce some of the research concepts uh, current within um, the management and support of people with BPD. What was it that led you from clinical psychology into more the research side of it? Thanks, Steve. I guess one of the things I found in clinical practice is I wasn't really sure what to do. I'd go to the literature to seek answers to the to these questions. And often in this space, when working with people with BPD, there were many gaps in the literature. And that kind of sent me down a path of being really interested in, in clinical research. Great. All right. Well, you'll bring that to us tonight. That's fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. We've also got Professor uh, Bryn Grenier, um, South Australia. Bryn, or you were in New South Wales? New South Wales. Yeah. New South Wales. Okay. Well, fabulous to have you. I thought you were in New South Wales. Um, what's on your desk at the moment in terms of research projects? What are you currently working on? Well, it's really exciting to be here and thanks. And it's so wonderful that 600 people have joined and to see also quite a few good friends um, joining too. Project AIR is a personality disorder strategy that I'm working with and we're really passionate about spreading 
hopeful messages about effective treatment across Australia. We've been doing a lot of work in New South Wales, but we're also really happy to have shared our experiences with people in other states and territories, South Australia, Victoria, um, and doing a big piece of work um, over the next five years also with Queensland. So we're really excited to be here and, and, to, and to do this kind of um, uh, webinar. Right. Well, it's a fabulous um, connection between research uh, and clinical practice. So uh, fabulous to have this opportunity um, to hear from you. So thank you so much. And last but not least, uh, says Professor Sathya Rao, um, who is a psychiatrist based here in Victoria, just around the corner, actually. I'm in Carlton at the moment. Sathya services in Richmond. But I must confess, I know very little about it. You're the clinical director at Spectrum. Sathya, can you tell us a little bit about what that services and what you do in that role. Thanks, Steve. Um, Spectrum is a publicly funded uh, statewide specialist service, and uh, we specialize in uh, working with people who have a personality disorder or a complex uh, trauma condition. So we provide uh, psychological treatments such as dietical behavior therapy, mentalization-based treatment, acceptance and commitment therapy, and uh, an integrated common factors approach at Spectrum. Uh, we also provide a secondary consultations to all the public mental services and some of the private sector and some primary sector across the state. And we also have, um, we do some work uh, interstate uh, uh, with complex, uh, where, where, where clients might have some complex needs. And that's briefly about us. We also do a lot of training and we have trained about 5,000 clinicians last year. And we also do some research and advocacy. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you. It's great to have actually you and all everybody tonight with such expertise in this field for a really informative um, discussion. We're not having a case presentation tonight uh, and a case discussion. We're talking more about each, each panellist will give us a presentation and then we'll have a conversation about that. And most importantly, we'll react to your questions that you can post in the Q&A, which means I must now take us through the mechanics of operating the system, see that there are three dots in the lower right corner of your screen, and that's where you can um, access a whole lot of information. Under the information tab, you'll find links to the slides that are being presented tonight, other resources that the panellists are recommending to us. Uh, there's a survey there, and also you can access technical support. The ground rules for tonight is to be respectful of other participants and panellists and to keep your comments on topic in the chat box. Obviously, what's in the chat box is a, a publication, so be very careful um, not to put anything there that you wouldn't wish uh, people to be reading and hearing. So what's going to happen now is each, each panellist will give a short discipline specific presentation followed by the Q&A between the panel. Uh, the learning outcomes are really important. Uh, we take this very seriously and it's what we base the evaluation around. So the aim is to discuss the latest uh, borderline personality disorder BPD research, evidence-based assessment, intervention and treatment strategies, including psychotherapy, with a focus on how mental health practitioners can best work with people who are living with BPD. The learning outcomes are there, you can see them, outline the major themes and findings from recent research on BPD, improve understanding of the way people present with BPD, prevention of stigma, interventions and treatments, and particularly identifying evidence-based strategies for how we as health practitioners can effectively support people living with borderline personality disorder. So there we go. That's all the introductory stuff done. We need to get on to the major reason why we're here tonight, which is to hear from these four experts and then to get involved in a conversation about what they've said and what questions you have. So don't forget to be posting your questions uh, under the Q&A tab there, as mentioned before, and we'll see what pops up there. Um, here we are. We've got somebody now. Michelle's off the mark, so it is possible to post a question. Thank you, Michelle. We'll get to that question coming up about high school students, which is great. Before we get there, though, Sophie, it's not too long ago for you, high school, but we do want to hear from you about your presentation now. So thanks very much indeed. Over to you. Thank you. Um 
From a clinical perspective, borderline personality disorder is compromised of nine different criteria and a person needs to meet at least five of those for a diagnosis. This means there are 256 combinations of criteria for a diagnosis. From a personal perspective, I see this as we are all so individual and can have such different experiences. And with that comes a lot of strengths that we all possess and also differences in what treatments may work best for us. Despite people with a diagnosis of BPD being able to live amazing lives and reach our dreams and goals, hold strengths and positive values, there's still so much stigma around. This makes it hard for us to speak out and to receive the treatment that we need and to access services. Next slide, please. To be treated with respect and dignity. When things are rough, we need to be heard. We need empathy, validation, and for someone to hold hope just like anyone else with any other diagnosis. We seek treatment and support. We seek connection. Yet we are met with stigma, harsh reactions, often made to feel like we don't matter, sometimes denied treatment. Next slide. October 1 to 7 is BPD Awareness Week in Australia. In 2019, the theme was flipping the script and was helped created from the voices of those with lived experience. A lot of common stigmatizing words that are strongly associated with BPD were reframed into something more hopeful. I shared these posters, including these two slides that you've seen just before and right now, throughout, um, I shared them last year throughout a peer and clinician led group for people living with BPD that Project Air Strategy ran. A lot of the participants found these posters helpful and such a beneficial way to reframe the hurtful words that we are often met with. Next slide. Redefining the language we use, not just as people, but also as mental health professionals can be beneficial for everyone. Using words that convey hope and optimism, using strengths-based and person-centered language that is not stigmatizing can have a huge impact on someone. Dialectical behavior therapy is the gold standard for treating BPD. I still remember the first time I tried DBT. It was early on with my diagnosis. Group therapy was something I wasn't prepared for and I was only doing DBT then to make others happy. So I felt it didn't really work. I went to, a, I went to about three sessions and then dropped out. I didn't feel comfortable sharing really vulnerable, vulnerable parts of myself in front of what felt like strangers in a therapeutic setting. Sorry, the lights turned off. At the same time, I was doing one-on-one -on -one schema therapy as part of the DBT group. The psychologist I had been put with was able to keep seeing me for the time allocated and with some gentle nudging, hope holding, validation and person-centered care, things started turning around for me, albeit briefly. I'd spent a lot of time seeing psychologists and doing CBT, but nothing really changed for me mentally. Once I got into schema therapy, it's like the puzzle pieces started fitting together. I also got to try something new with that psychologist and ask them a few questions. They were just some based on my own interests, such as if they like cats. And seeing the psychologist in a more personable way really helped with creating a safe space. As a peer worker and having been a participant in peer group therapy, I feel like knowing more aspects of that person can help break down that barrier and make building rapport easier. Unfortunately, I could only see the psychologist for the year, but I was able to find another one locally who also does schema therapy and was able to take me on. After giving consent for a bit of a handover over between the two psychs and with the new one having a bit of knowledge about what I want to work on and what's helpful for me in a therapeutic setting, I got everything sorted and started with them, who I still see to this day. I know it's a safe space. I was able to ask a few questions of my own at the start and doing that made such a positive impact for me with helping to build the rapport and create a safe and trusting environment. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, I've also done a few more rounds of DPT. Attending on my own decision really helped make it easier for me to learn the skills and keep practicing them on a daily basis. Being ready for DBT in a group therapy setting made such a huge difference for me. 
knowing that I had to be vulnerable in front of strangers, knowing that the skills I learned needed to be practiced daily, and knowing that I had to put in a lot of work for change to be felt and seen. I also really appreciate when the clinician practiced the skills with us. Knowing that they use the skills and the skills help them makes them feel more favoured. I find that it is such a powerful impact with peer work and a part that I really enjoy. Talking about the skills I use and when I use them throughout the day and being able to be honest about it being hard at first, but with practice comes achievement. Next slide, please. When someone asks me how best to support someone living with BPD, I tell them a few of the things that have helped me throughout my life. Listen to them, really listen to them, validate them and hold hope. Be there for them, yet also keep your own boundaries in place. Be open with them when you need to take a step back or are busy and let them know you'll be back for them. Remind them of their strengths and remember that self-care is important for everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sophie. That was exactly what we needed to hear. It was really important. Um, there are a number of questions uh, that have come up that relate to what you've been saying. So uh, we'll save those until we get to the conversation part at the end. But there's certainly lots of things people want to hear about. So thanks again for um, telling us your perspective. Um, we will now hear from Diana, uh, particularly with a, a researcher's perspective. So over to you, Diana, thanks. Thanks. So as mentioned, I'm the research coordinator at the BPD Collaborative in South Australia, um, and we're a statewide service that was established in 2019. So I'm going to speak to some of the research that relates to the steps model of care that we've adopted and how we aim to engage people with a lived experience in service development and delivery. So the literature shows that specialist therapies for BPD, such as dialectical behaviour, mentalisation-based treatment, transference-focused psychotherapy and schema therapy are effective in reducing overall borderline personality disorder symptom severity when compared to non-specialised approaches. However, access to intensive evidence-based treatments is limited due to the duration, cost, and also the length and intensity of training for therapists. As such, stepped care models have been suggested, and that's defined by beginning with the least intensive treatment that's likely to be effective, monitoring response to increase or reduce intensity of the intervention according to the person's need. Next slide. Um, so compared to specialised therapies, there's much less research into brief interventions for people diagnosed with BPD. Some Victor research that comes from Victoria found that an audit of coroner's records among people with a diagnosis of BPD who died by suicide, 25% had presented to an ED in the previous six weeks. And this is kind of paired with research that shows that there are inconsistent responses to people with BPD in emergency settings, which suggests that it's important for us to have structured ways of responding to people in an acute crisis. Other research has shown that people with BPD benefit from psychoeducation soon after diagnosis when compared to waitlist controls. Also, brief interventions such as Gold Car, which is promoted by Project DARE, have been found to reduce BPD symptoms, vary your stress and improve quality of life. And this is an approach that we've been implementing across South Australia um, for the last three years. Next slide. When considering short-term interventions, Meta-analysis suggests that psychological therapies less than six months in duration may be effective. However, the studies have many limitations, which means that strong conclusions can't be drawn, but it does suggest or contrast with historical recommendations from clinical guidelines that short interventions should not be offered. It's also been suggested that less resourceive intensive therapies could be developed through integrating common factors from effective evidence-based therapies for BPD. In a real-world setting, patients in both the short-term and extended care clinics with BPD demonstrated outcomes. 
So while some patients need longer treatment, the results are encouraging for short treatment as a first step in care. In South Australia, we currently have a non-randomised controlled clinical trial comparing naturalistic wait list to 12-week group intervention developed based from common factors of evidence-based therapies that we're evaluating. Next slide, please. One of the other projects that we've been working on is our peer group co-production. So it was clear in the development of our model of care that consumers wanted to act about peer groups specifically for people with a diagnosis of BPD at the time. A co-production approach was undertaken with a committee of people with lived experience of borderline personality disorder. A peer group was developed, which is 10 weeks long. It's co-facilitated by a lived experience officer, Jess, and a senior mental health clinician here at BPD Co. We interviewed participants, 22 people who'd completed the group, and then themed the, in the responses from those interviews about how they found the group. The key themes that came out were that it provided them with growth and change. It helped them to feel connected and feel understood. And one of the clear things that came out was the importance of the shared experiences. So it was also noted that the group helped them create a, a situation where they felt safe and they particularly valued the equal footing between them and the facilitators. Next slide. So we've also had a number of re um, students do research projects with us over the past couple of years. And these have sort of looked at attitudes towards people. Um, the first one, Sierra found that positive correlations between personality pathology and minority stress among Australian sexual and gender minority populations, which suggested that clinicians should ensure they consider sexual or gender minority status and the associated minority stress when diagnosing personality disorders. We also had Rhea, who found that psychiatry trainees near the end of training had a significantly more negative view of patients with BPD compared to early and mid-stage trainees, which was very concerning and highlights the need for us to look at interventions in that space. Finally, Molly evaluated a foundational training, a one-day program that's um, being offered to clinicians, and we delivered that with experts with lived experience. She found that this improved clinicians' attitudes towards people with a diagnosis of BPD, particularly for those early in their career or where they had less experience with people with BPD. Final slide. Thank you. So the key messages are um, people with a diagnosis of BPD may gain benefit from structured psychological interventions spanning from one to three months while waiting for access to more intensive evidence-based therapies. It's important to engage people with a lived experience of BPD and their carers in training delivery and the co-production of interventions. Thanks. Lovely, Diana. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, certainly there's been a very positive response in the chat box uh, to Sophie's presentation and also some responses to Diana's presentation. Um, I think it'll be interesting when we do get to our conversation to compare the research versus the personal experience of Sophie and such things like being in a group and what that feels like. Um, we'll come to that, as I say, all these teasers coming up uh, once we get onto our conversation. But first of all, uh, we'll hear from Bryn, who's going to give us the clinical psychologist's perspective. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And look, thank you particularly to Sophie and Diana for those really important introductions to what it feels like in terms of the lived experience and what actually helps. And I think there's a few myths that are being broken down here tonight around um, things around stigma, about hopefulness and about the real the real benefits of psychological therapy which is the treatment of choice. And Sophie talked about, you know, her experience of both DBT, but also doing uh, schema therapy and the importance of the relationship and how it is that uh, that really helped to build trust and to build a, 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 a real sense of recovery journey for her. So I'm going to just say a few words about when we ask people with lived experience and when we study longitudinal outcomes, and ask the question, what do people really want? Well, 
what they really want is to love and to work, to be able to get on well with others and to hold down a job or to finish their study and to, to do something meaningful. And when you look at people who do well uh, in therapy, often it's alongside psychological therapy, they're also contributing in some way or maintaining some sense of stability. And in many ways, what it does is re reinforce our basic understanding that, you know, in many ways, you know, this, this BPD is often a disorder of relationships and being able to get on well, well with yourself, with a therapist, with partners, with families, with schools, with employers. And so when we go in and offer psychological therapy, we need to very much think about how can we help the person develop a more stable um, and more constructive uh, relationships with, with all of those uh, aspects of their lives? Next slide, please. So I've, I've developed these uh, seven steps to good enough therapy, and it's really, I suppose, trying to show the wisdom that we've learned from both research and our own clinical practice for what can really make a difference. The first, of course, really does reinforce what both Diana and Sophie talked about, and that is stigma is a really big problem, and we really need to focus on compassionate care and ensuring that people understand what's going on for them. I think you know, Sophie talked about how she didn't know what was happening to her for a long time. A lot of the people we work with say that the problems that they had started when they were at school, but nobody actually recognised them then. And it was only five or 10 or 15 years later that they actually found out and got the right diagnosis and worked out what kind of treatment they needed. Many people with lived experience say that the start of their recovery is when they got the diagnosis and that helped them to plan for what needs to happen next. And even though diagnosis is controversial, what we do know is that not, not telling people what's going on for them, not helping them to understand the nature of their difficulties keeps them stuck often and um, and that's uh, often leads to a lot of uh, negative outcomes. So we do need to be help hopeful as well because we do have treatments that do work. And as Diana said, short-term therapies do have a place. So although there can be a lot of helplessness and hopelessness about um, person A disorders and a real kind of a myth that you, you can only do effective care if it's very long-term, the research from our um, group and also internationally shows that even brief episodes of care can really make a difference. And so I think we should all start off with the idea that doesn't matter how short our contact is with somebody, we can do good work and really help. The third step is really to focus on relationships, both inside the therapy and also outside in terms of families, peers, employers, and really to, to, to focus on, I suppose, what it feels like inside um, people uh, talk about in terms of not really understanding themselves and not really understanding others. We also know in that step four that everybody has the capacity to make choices and cho being able to make choices and showing some agency really does help to set people on a recovery journey. And that can be difficult because often people at the start of their care often say, I don't know what I want. I don't know. I want you to help me. I want you to tell me what to do. And can be very kind of like, I suppose, external in their locus of control. And our role as therapists is really to be curious and try and help them get onto the stage where they can recognize that they do have choices and that they can do something different today, tomorrow, and over the next week that'll make the following week better than the week that they just had. And just start in the here and now around how to live a life worth living and how to improve the moment. That means that we have to be active in the therapy room we, in many ways, um, this is not the kind of work where you just sit back and hope that by the, 
the person talking about all their problems that they'll all just kind of get resolved. You actually kind of need to step in there and help them shape what um, the future might look like and what things that they can actually do to help them with their current challenges to really help them learn how to solve them themselves and how to provide our input and our guidance in that journey. And to do that, you know, we know that often people with these difficulties have trauma. Not everyone has trauma who has BPD. Some people do. Some people are in situations where they also have multiple diagnoses. They might be you know, neurodiverse. They might have other kinds of challenges, substance dependence or whatever. And in many ways, our first goal is to create a sense of safety, stability and predictability. And that can even be something like just saying to the person, you know what, this is your hour. I've set it aside it every week and I will be here whether you come or not. And let's just see how far we go. And that, I think, gives people a sense that, you know, you're predictable, that you know that you're going to be there for them and that you're offering yourself to hold a space in your mind for them and uh, and that really makes a big difference. And I think the final thing, and this is probably, you know, a common experience is that this can be hard work and people can, you know, feel very suicidal. There can be all sorts of crises and difficulties and therapists need to look after themselves as well. The best way to do that is really just to have a trusted colleague that you talk about what's going on in the progress of the sessions with your with your client so that you can calibrate your own reactions, maintain your own hopefulness, and in a sense, help you to look at your own counter-transference responses, which can sometimes be blind spots. They can be rescue fantasies that we might have. They can be impulses that we might have to reject the person or withdraw or overlook. Um, and so that we can try and maintain, a, I suppose, a good enough um, therapy approach uh, where we can uh, be honest and recognize our limitations as well. Next slide. Just a final comment on that. And, uh, and I suppose this is one of the key messages in Project Air that I, I work with, we say a lot, is to keep calm and make tea. And that is, it really helps in many ways to slow everything down. Because in with people with personality disorder and BPD, often the experience is people become reactive. So they become very risk averse, they become very panicky and worried. And often um, what people really want is for you to be reflective rather than reactive. And that means that we need to model to be contagious through calm, to help a person slow things down. Just like when you make a cup of tea, you've got to boil the water, put in the tea, let the hot water seep with the tea leaves. And by the time you poured it out, you're in a different place than you were when you first put on the kettle. And that kind of sense of letting things brew and letting yourself, you know, really share and understand the situation is such a powerful, um, I suppose, way of us thinking about what um, we can do to be effective in the room and uh, with families and carers and others who we might be consulting with at the same time. Thank you. Thanks, Bryn. Uh, seeing in the chat, you've given Fran a light bulb moment, at least with your presentation, which is great, and plenty of others also getting a lot out of that. Lots of conversation going on about um, the challenge of appropriate diagnosis. So I'm sure we'll come to that in our discussion as well. So now the final presentation of these prepared ones is the psychiatrist's perspective uh, from Satya. Over to you. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Uh, before I start my presentation, I just want to thank uh, Sophie, Diana, and Bren for the excellent presentation they've done, uh, which makes my my job much more easier now. Um, I'm going to uh, talk briefly about uh, what's the current understanding of the causation of borderline personality disorder, uh, diagnostic issues, and the biological approaches to uh, treatment. Next slide, please. Let me start with the age of onset. 
Uh, BPD usually emerges during adolescence. And according to the uh, NHMRC uh, guidelines, one can diagnose borderline personality disorder from the age of 12, uh, post puberty, of course. And of course, we need to commence appropriate treatments. And uh, there's a lot of good work from uh, Australia to show that early intervention works quite well. However, we know that BPD can present across life stages at any point uh, in, in the life stage. Late manifestation of borderline personality disorder is also known. It can manifest for the first time even in uh, 50s and 60s. We at Spectrum have recently diagnosed uh, someone with a borderline personality disorder for the first time at the age of 76. And we offer treatment and uh, yeah, this person has successfully improved. Next slide, please. So what causes borderline personality disorder? We know that uh, biological and psychological factors together uh, probably cause borderline personality disorder with each person having a unique pathway to developing BPD. However, there is dispute regarding the relative contribution of uh, these factors. Next slide, please. We know that uh, there are some problems in the brain, uh, specifically the emotion brain, the amygdala, is overactive. And the part of the brain that is meant to control, uh, modulate or regulate the emotion brain is less active. And half of the reason why people uh, seem to develop BPD is probably because of uh, genetics. The genetic heritability effect uh, in borderline personality disorder is about 55 to 68%. Uh, uh, this is a mathematical model. What it, re what it says is that if it was 100%, every offspring would have developed borderline personality disorder. It is also known that the first degree relatives have a higher chance of developing borderline personality disorder. It's about five times. Next slide, please. Trauma is very, very common in borderline personality disorder. Uh, my, uh, my colleague Bryn alluded to this, and trauma-informed care is absolutely essential. However, trauma alone does not seem to cause borderline personality disorder. Trauma is a clear risk factor, but not essential for developing borderline personality disorder. Trauma in the presence of biological factors may result in uh, borderline personality disorder. Uh, my colleague Bryn again uh, mentioned that not everybody has trauma when they have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. So when it comes to trauma, correlation, yes. Causation, probably no. Next slide, please. So what is the contribution of biology versus environment when it comes to uh, causation of borderline personality disorder? In the past, this resulted in the debate of nature versus nurture, uh, which is probably now quite outdated. Now we need to uh, consider nature and nurture, nature via nurture, or nature via nurture via nature. Next slide, please. So uh, when it comes to borderline personality disorder, co-occurrence is very, very common. It is actually the norm rather than exception. Sophie earlier on mentioned how each person with BPD is unique when it comes to the symptom profile. Only 5% of people with borderline personality disorder tend to present only with BPD. BPD has been said to be the king of comorbid kingdom uh, by one of the experts, uh, highlighting the significant overlapping and co-occurring uh, mental health conditions. This is a very important issue that we need to consider uh, both while we are considering diagnosis as well as when we are looking at treatments that we offer for people with body and personality disorder. So you can see on the slide some of the important co-occurring conditions in the interest of time. I'm not going to go through this list, but happy to pick it up uh, in a discussion. Next slide, please. So it is important to note that the mental health conditions that coexist with the borderline personality disorder 
do not respond to medications robustly unless borderline personality disorder is treated with psychological treatments. Where borderline personality disorder co-occur with other mental conditions, we get best possible desired outcomes when both conditions are treated simultaneously. So in summary, if there's borderline personality disorder, we must treat borderline personality disorder with psychological treatments. Unless we do that, whatever the other co-occurring conditions that's going to be along with that, it's not going to respond to treatments very well. Next slide, please. Let's look at some of the biological approaches to borderline personality disorder. Uh, unfortunately, there are no medicines that are patented or indicated for borderline personality disorder. There is no evidence to suggest that we can prescribe any medication very confidently in borderline personality disorder, especially because uh, these medicines cause so much of side effects and there's a risk of overdose. And also, it, most importantly, it distracts from the psychological treatment that is so important. There is very limited evidence for some medicines such as lamotrigine, lopiramide, omega-3 fatty acids, the fish oil, and uh, quatipin in small doses for crisis management. Electroconvulsive therapy and transcranial magnetic stimulation, they again don't seem to work for borderline personality disorder, even if BPD co-occurs with depression. Uh, psychedelics, which are now going to come into the market from uh, July, uh, it's an interesting option. Again, they, 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 we need to build evidence and test it out. Right now, there is no evidence. Next slide, please. So in summary, the take-home message is having borderline personality disorder is not the person's own fault. It is a disorder of the brain and the mind. This is a statement made in the NHMRC clinical practice guidelines. I think this is the best one sentence, two sentence I've seen in the guideline. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. My take home message is that uh, as long as you don't judge, as long as you try to validate the valid, and as long as you can tolerate the emotions, both your emotions and their emotions, and teach them skills to improve the quality of life, you can contribute to the recovery journey. Give it a go. This is a statement from a Canadian expert, Joe Paris. All the best. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sathya. And we've got a solid half hour now for our conversation, and you've all given us lots to think about, and we'll get to that immediately. You will have now seen, those of you who are not having internet troubles, will have seen a slide pop up that's got uh, a couple of QR codes on it. We didn't know what these were three years ago. We do now. These are an invitation for you to um, take out your mobile device if you're not already using it for the webinar. And if you want to register your interest to lead or join an existing VPD network, uh, then you can um, get a link to a URL to do that. Or if you wanted to start one in your area, if there's not one in your area, you can click on or um, shoot the other QR code. Um, so um, just a moment while you do that, um, if you want to uh, express interest in that, it'll give the team at um, MHPN an opportunity to communicate with you about that. So thank you all so much for your presentations. As I say, the uh, the response in the chat room has been absolutely fabulous to all of them. Um, and I am seeing more questions in the uh, moderators area than I've ever seen in one of these MHPN webinars. So there's plenty for us to deal with. But it seems um, more than appropriate to go back to Sophie and ask Sophie one of the questions which has come in. This has been from Ryan. He's asking about readiness for uh, DBT and saying basically, thanks, Sophie. I'm curious about your thoughts on what might be some of the general indicators for where a consumer may be more likely to be ready, in inverted commas, to commence DBT and get real value from it. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because you said that you didn't like the group first up, but then second time round you were sort of ready for it. What are your thoughts? Um, I guess with me, when I first got diagnosed with BPD, I wasn't given any information about what it was and I just got told that the only thing that will help with that was doing a therapy called dialectical behaviour therapy 
And I also got no information about what that was or what it involved. So I was just going in blind. Um, I remember to be accepted into this DBT group, I had like, oh, I went to an assessment day and it felt like I was there nearly all day. And at the end, it was like, yes, you do have DBT and we'll put you on the waiting list and we don't know when it's going to start, but it should be early next year. And there was still really not a lot of information given about BPD or DBT. So again, I was still just like no information whatsoever. So yeah, that wasn't that was not helpful for me. Um, yeah, as I said, you know, DBT felt but just didn't feel comfortable for me that, yeah, doing the one-on-one -on -one therapy, the schema therapy, being able to still do that without doing the DBT component. Oh, no, that, makes sense. Do any of the other experts have any thoughts about that question, how you can tell when a, um, a person's more likely to respond than not? Bryn, it looks like you're on mute. Um, there are two, I think there are two parts to this. One is that understanding the diagnosis and being able to, you know, often if you show people the nine criteria and you go through them, they kind of have a light bulb moment and say, wow, I didn't realise that there are other people that had these problems, not just me. And if you then follow that up with psychoeducation about what actually can help and um, what recovery might look like and introduce them to people like Sophie, if you have peer workers um, in your service or uh, in your team, that really helps people to kind of like understand and have the sort of the aha moment, not only like, there's, I'm not alone, but also there's hope around uh, overcoming this. Yeah. And Second thing in terms of being ready for DBT, I think that then leads into the idea that why DBT might work. And one of the core principles there is that one that we talked about before about being active. Like the person needs to go in with an attitude like, I want to do this for myself and I want to try and live a life worth living that's different than the one I've just been living. And if you, if the person goes in with that attitude, I think DBT has got a lot to offer, as do the other psychotherapies. What can happen, though, is people can be so, um, I suppose, stigmatised or traumatised or helpless and hopeless that they think that somehow there's a magic cure and there is no magic cure, as Sathya said. Um, you know, you can't just attend DBT and expect that things are going to change unless you bring you, yourself into that and a willingness to, to work on it. Thanks for that. And um, I should say that Andy um, from Everyone Psychology in the chats picked up on Sophie's words about going in blind and just how awful that must feel. And what you've said, Bryn, is that the, the power of the peer support person who can give you some orientation to what to expect, it means that you're not blind, you're actually seeing it through somebody else's eyes. So that's a, a fabulous insight. Thanks so much for that. Um, so... Another question, actually, I'm going to go right back to first principles here. I've seen something in the chat that's caught my eye because I didn't know. Borderline personality disorder. Border of what? I, I realise I've got no idea why we call it borderline. It might seem a very basic question, but can somebody give me just 30 seconds on why we have used that term? Why borderline? I, I can answer it. It comes from 1938. And our understanding of psychiatry then was that there were people who had neurotic disorders like anxiety and depression, and there were people who had schizophrenia where they lost contact with reality. And a person called Adolf Stern said, actually, you know what, there's a, people, a group of people in the middle. So they're no, neither just anxious and depressed, nor are they completely have lost contact with reality with hallucinations and delusions, but they have this kind of complex set of uh, problems that kind of fit in the middle or what he called the borderline. So that's how the term comes about. It's really unfortunate 
but it sort of stuck over all of those years. But that was the original thinking around why that term was there. Okay, thanks for that. You've solved it for me. That's wonderful. Something good that came out of 1938, I guess, was some thinking. <laughs> but that's actually quite some time ago now. So uh, great to hear that there's new research and new thinking going on. Speaking again of research, there was one thing that uh, Diana mentioned, which well, the first time I saw her presentation, I was struck by it. And um, uh, others have been struck by it as well, including Erin, who's asked the question, why are psychiatry trainees near the end of their training holding negative or more negative views of people with BPD? Is this sort of the hardening of the heart that we see within medical schools? And what's behind it? That's a really good question. I mean, um, the research didn't address that specific aspect in terms of why people held those attitudes. Um, but I guess there were some hypotheses about why it might be so in terms of whether when psychiat whether the psychiatry registers are having more experience within, say, emergency departments or acute settings and then perhaps being influenced by some of the systematic stigma that might be occurring in those settings. But it's definitely an area which we, we're wanting to look at further to actually, you know, sort of unpack what some of those reasons might be. So I must say as a GP, emergency departments seem to be the worst place to see people at their worst. Um, and it sounds like that might be something that's going on there. It does lead us to some questions that have been asked about um, the really awful end of this suicidal um, ideation or attempts and whether the panel has any um, quick tips, quick tips for a very complex problem for what to do when somebody is um, expressing suicidality. Uh, do, do you want me to make yes, a comment? Matthew, please, it's um, uh, a question without notice, so please um, jump in. Uh, Steve, maybe I, I, can I make a comment about the psychiatry training first? Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I'm really sorry to say, even to this day, we don't train psychiatrists adequately in the treatment of borderline personal disorder. So that's the reason why they don't feel confident at the, towards the end of the training. And that's why they pick up the prescription pads very quickly. So we are trying to work with the college uh, and advocate for more, more specific training for uh, borderline personal disorder. So coming to uh, the suicidal uh, uh, ideations uh, and behaviors, uh, the, the life becomes so painful, so unbearable for people with borderline personal disorder and the psychological pain that they experience pushes them towards uh, societal behaviors. So what we find in our uh, setting at uh, uh, Spectrum, uh, once we start working with them uh, with psychological uh, treatments, most of the times by about, within about six months time, um, the societal behaviors uh, tend to uh, reduce quite significantly. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure Bryn would agree with me and others would agree with me. Uh, there is very good uh, evidence to show that uh, when people are in treatment, when they're receiving psychological treatments, people don't actually resort to dying by suicide. So it's the lack of treatment which tends to uh, result in that. Of course, uh, within the NHMRC guidelines, we have proposed a way of trying to understand uh, who could be at an immediate risk of uh, trying suicide uh, versus who could be at a risk of having you know, ongoing uh, chronic suicidal uh, thoughts and uh, behaviors. So there's some uh, risk methodology we have worked out that one can refer to in the national guidelines. Thank you. Thanks for that. And a shout out to Lauren, who's an early career psychiatrist in the chat, who's acknowledging that more training is needed in this area. Um, it's so difficult to um, uh, to cover everything, of course, but this does seem to be a really important one. And making the diagnosis as well. And that's actually a question that's been asked um, by somebody whose name I'm afraid I've forgotten, which was about um, communicating the BPD diagnosis, and we're still struggling with that term. But 
uh, the comment was, I've had experiences where communicating a BPD diagnosis has led to relief in understanding experiences and improvement in self-development, but other people are effectively traumatised by the diagnosis. Just wondering um, what people's thoughts are about uh, the response to being given a diagnosis of BPD and what that can mean to the person. Maybe, Sophie, we should start with you. Uh, any any thoughts before maybe we go to Bryn? Yeah, um, as I said, I didn't get a lot of information about it when I was first diagnosed. Um, I was in hospital. I remember I had a nurse told me they always knew when someone with BPD would be admitted because they always had like brightly coloured hair, um, which I have. And they would have like, you know, their fluffy comfort toys or like, you know, fluffy slippers. And that just felt really judgmental. Um, you know, I've got a lot of other friends with brightly coloured hairs. Like, does that mean they also have BPD? Absolutely not. Um, so I think, you know, giving the person information about BPD would make it so much easier. I know if I'd been given like factual information about what it is, how, you know, people get diagnosed, like the nine different criteria, um, ask, you know, if you want to know what criteria you met and, you know, learn how to, you know, maybe at a later stage, learn how to see that you fit the criteria. Um, and yeah, just finding out that, you know, that there are treatments available and that they help. And then, you know, if there's, if you know of peer workers, like put them in contact and, you know, hearing, you know, that hearing from other people that, you know, they've been there, they've done that. And, you know, they're now, you know, yeah, look, living, I'm living their best life. And I'm so pleased to see a comment from Jane in the chat that her son found comfort in the diagnosis and strength to go forward. So that's that's great. What about you, Bryn? What are your thoughts about uh, the diagnosis and what it can do for people or two people? Yeah, look, I I agree that it. What's really important is the way it's done, and you want to spend time helping the person understand it and do it in a really compassionate way. But the most important thing, I think, is to make the link between diagnosis and treatment because there's no good just saying you've got BPD, ah, ha, ha, go away, there's nothing we can do for you. What you need to say is you've got BPD and guess what? This is good news because actually we know how to treat it and there are good treatments and I can help you get them or I can start them myself or this is what the journey might look like in terms of um, accessing the right kind of evidence-based treatment, psychological therapies, and uh, helping the person see what the next step is on their on their journey, not just leaving them with the diagnosis with no further information. Right. All right. Thank you so much for that. I'm seeing a fair response also to Sophie's statement about the um, brightly coloured hair being a diagnostic indicator of BPD in the nurse's eyes. I was taught at medical school that tinted glasses was an indicator, reliable indicator of um, mental illness. But uh, then the 80s came and everybody had tinted glasses, which I thought was quite a good thing. Um, a number of people have also asked questions about BPD in younger patients and sort of threshold for diagnosis in teenagers uh, and younger people. And uh, one of the questions was uh, from Anita um, about BPD in adolescents and that uh, adolescents are rarely diagnosed with BPD confidently. Um, however, more and more young clients in Anita's experience are saying they've been given this diagnosis. Um, I was wondering, Satya, maybe you have a thought about that? Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, it's an interesting question because uh, for a long time, uh, we believed that uh, personalities uh, did not fully blossom and develop until the age of 18. And uh, so, therefore, uh, a lot of child psychiatrists uh, and uh, and even adult psychiatrists believe that we should not make a definitive diagnosis of borderline personality disorder till the age of 18 because sometimes the symptoms can change and, you know, diagnosis can change. Uh, however, that's, that's, a, that's an old belief. Uh, now, 
um, particularly uh, in the Australian context. Uh, Professor Andrew Channon has done brilliant work in this field and he's a leader globally. And he has demonstrated again and again and again that we can confidently make a diagnosis below the age of 18 and we can confidently treat people below the age of 18. Earlier we treat, the better it is. We don't want people to have symptoms and struggle with, with all the symptoms for years and years and years. So if it looks like BPD, uh, we should make a diagnosis of BPD and start treating. Of course, we want to consider a diagnosis only in people post puberty. So in fact, in the Australian context, uh, we would encourage people to make a diagnosis from the age of 12. That's in the NHMRC clinical practice guidelines, clearly. Uh, but the scenario has still not changed uh, uh, completely. I think people are getting more and more confident. I, I would encourage uh, families and uh, 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 consumers to actually ask uh, and demand for a clear diagnosis and treatment. All right, thank you for that. It was interesting to hear you mention Andrew Chan, and I went to school with Andrew in the 70s. I still can't get used to people who've known since they're 12 having a huge impact on, uh, <laughs> on the country, but that's great. Good to hear that he's, um, he's kicked on. Um, look, there's a question. I'm just conflating a few people's questions here, which is about the interface between people with BPD and people also using um, other drugs or various drugs. Now, Sethi has given that... Uh, given medication a bad rap. Um, the cup of tea from Bryn did seem to get more traction with the audience than um, the psychotherapeutic approaches. But people have been asking questions about people who are also using um, other drugs, um, uh, non-prescribed drugs, and whether there are any thoughts about that. Sathya, I see you've come off mute. Are you wanting to comment about that? In your area, yeah. you see this quite uh, a bit. Uh, I'm happy to comment and we can uh, also invite my, my other colleagues to uh, make additional comments because they, I'm sure they have very interesting views on this. Uh, first of all, I think we need to be kind and compassionate uh, for people who use substances when they also have borderline personality disorder. First is to recognize that borderline personality disorder is a complex, difficult, painful disorder to uh, experience. So people are desperate to try and manage it in whatever ways they can. And substance use is one of the common ways. Nearly two thirds of the people tend to use substances. Now, again, we have done some uh, research at Spectrum and shown that when we give, when people have evidence-based treatments, their substance use reduces dramatically. So in, in our patient population, once we do the uh, treatment, by the end of treatment, we have not specifically treated for substance use, but they've all come off drugs, majority of them. So again, uh, we are, what we are all trying to emphasize is that treatment is the key. When, I say, when we talk about treatment, it is a psychological treatment. That's the key. All right. Thank you for that. Um, more questions also about the overlap, the interface. Now that we know that we're talking about a borderline between two big groups of diagnoses, people are also asking about uh, um, young people with autism um, and uh, other things. People with eating disorders was also another one that's come up in the chat. Uh, now, we did see a long list of comorbidities in Zathia's presentation, but do any panellists have any thoughts about how we approach people who might have more than one diagnosis uh, and whether that impacts on the way we we uh, provide service? Bryn, you look like you've, you can talk on that. Yeah, it's a very common. So comorbidity, I think, is probably more expected to be part of anyone's uh, history um, so I think the NHNMRC makes it quite clear that in all of these cases, whether it's substance dependence, autism, ADHD, other, you know, eating disorders, our goal is to treat the person and for there to be one therapist that, you know, helps the person with the core issues that um, they're struggling with. From, a, from the lens of BPD, the key thing that we're really trying to help the person with is to develop a stronger sense of identity of who they are, 
what they want in life, where they want to go, and to give them a capacity to have a voice and to develop and strengthen their voice. Because often people, you know, have difficulty understanding their emotions. They have big emotions. They might be very hypersensitive. They might be trying to manage their difficult internal feelings through impulsivity, through eating or, um, you know, interpersonal conflicts or control or whatever. But trying to understand that and being curious and sitting there with the person and trying to really kind of get yourself inside and see the world through their eyes and be curious and try and hear what's going on for them and to try and help them to start to, through this, through this process of talking and the interchange of that and them learning from you and you learning from them, that is going to strengthen their sense of, you know, what's going on for them and to help building um, on and to try and help them to learn skills and strategies and ways of being able to understand themselves that are going to be much more hopeful and helpful through that relationship. So it's a great opportunity to ask the question of Sophie. Sophie, does Brim's curiosity resonate with you? Yes, it does. Um, it really does. Like, I've got, I'm also diagnosed with anxiety. Um, so I feel like that really comes up a lot. And I guess since we've been with BPD now for quite a number of years, I've kind of learned and I'm still learning what anxiety feels like and what BPD feels like. And, you know, it's about, you know, treating the person as a person and not just looking at one diagnosis. And I feel that that has happened to me previously and that, you know, I know that BPD is very complex and that there are treatments that work, but also, you know, there's also different treatments for different diagnoses that can also help, help when you do live with BPD as well. And yeah, just having curiosity about person and also finding out the person's curiosity as well as I often speak about one of my strengths is being curious and that has helped me through really dark times is trying to keep my own curiosity alive, which helps get me forward to the next day when all I can do is live my life minute by minute. You talked about that in your presentation and having a degree of curiosity about your therapist, whether they're a cat person, for example. I'm a rampant dog person, I must confess. But um, how do the other three panellists feel about that? I mean, what sort of um, openness and self-disclosure can be helpful in building that trust and rapport with the person? And what sort of... Um, barriers or appropriate boundaries do we need to set? Any thoughts about that? Well, I'll jump in and say it's it's a balance. So you need to be both real in the room, but you also need to be safe. So my my general kind of philosophy here is don't be weird. Don't, you know, go down the path of overly self-disclosing nor go down the path of being so kind of like professional that you become like some sort of frozen kind of robot sort of situation puppet. You kind of want to be real, um, but appropriate um, in terms of, you know, who you are and what you're trying to offer and what you can do and you're, and to be willing to show your own limitations and show your sense of humor and also show sometimes your own, emotional reactions too so it's fine to cry and it's fine to laugh and it's fine to be there with the person as long as you're being honest to yourself and you're being really um clear about what's going on for you and differentiating but about what's going on for you but keeping the focus on really helping them on their journey um that's really you know how how we can be in the room and be as helpful as possible but of course, it's got to be in a safe environment. So the the structure of therapy, the consistency, and the the basic ground rules need to be really clear. Thanks, Bryn. We we're going to have to get a merch store going with these webinars. We've got people wanting to make mugs with "Keep Calm and Make a Cup of Tea." 
Don't Be Weird, I think would probably be a really good T-shirt for to be administered or given out to all psych registrars when they begin their, their training. Um, fabulous comments. So thank you so much for that. We're, we're at the point of our evening now where we just need final comments from each of the panellists as we, we pull it all together. So let's go around in the same order. Sophie, is there any final quick word you want to say to the audience before we wrap up? Um, I wish we could have more time to answer more questions because I feel that, you know, I've, having the space is it. really important. There are hundreds of questions we haven't got to tonight, and so I'm sorry about that. But what did you want to say at this stage? But I'm sorry I can't answer all the questions. But, yeah, um, just keep being curious and you will get an answer to your question at one stage. Fabulous. And curiosity is probably the antidote to burnout, so that's great, great advice. Thank you for that. Uh, Diana, what's your final thoughts for the evening? Yeah, I think curiosity is a, a really good one to reflect on as a as a researcher is uh, keeping up to date with the literature, um, being open to new ideas and ways of doing things, uh, particularly when it comes to around engaging people with a lived experience in treatment and, and listening to their voices and be willing to try different things, which I think we've found um, to be a really powerful experience for the co-production of the peer group. Um, and I guess also keeping um, the, the role of patient sort of reported outcomes in terms of integrating into treatment um, and being able to learn more from a research perspective to be able to you know, answer some of these questions. There's, there's just so many gaps in the literature and, and much more needs to be done. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Thanks very much. Bring your final comments. Look, I think just going back to that final comment about keeping calm and making tea, we do need to recognise that burnout is a risk, that um, we need to look after ourselves. We need to have somebody that we trust that we download to, and we need to also slow things down ourselves and um, really recognise that you know, when we're working with people who are really struggling, you know, that has an impact on us and we need to take time out and uh, seek the kind of support that we need so that we can maintain our own hopefulness and compassion to go back and gain and do the work over and over again. Absolutely. No, thank you. That's really important words. Um, and finally, Sathya, your, your, your thoughts. Thanks. Uh, Steve, I would like to emphasize again what uh, Bryn uh, said about not being weird uh, in therapy. Uh, uh, one of the ways to do it is um, to be aware of whatever we are sharing with the patients as to whether when we are sharing something, is it to the benefit of the other person or is it just to get out our own frustrations? If the answer is the second one, of course we shouldn't do it. And there should be clear limits and flexibility. but. Uh, as we put it in dietical behavior therapy, the relationship between a client and a therapist is a real relationship. It's a honest and real relationship, although professional. Um, I would like to emphasize that there are no medicines for people with borderline personality disorder. So let's not get preoccupied with medicines. And people get better all the time with psychological treatments. Uh, I have had immense professional satisfaction working with people with borderline personality disorder. So I would invite all, all the clinicians, mental professionals in this group to give it a go. Absolutely. That was your final comment on your slide. Give it a go uh, and go with the best of intent. So thank you all so much for participating in tonight's webinar. There's been a lot of requests for a part two. We might get to four, four seasons like succession maybe, but hopefully none of us will be getting on a plane to Sweden. Anyway, that's a, that's a weird reference. Uh, but thank you all so much. Um, well, I am going to ask you before people click off to complete the exit survey and provide us feedback. It's really important that we know um, how to provide these webinars better. So please use that QR code or click on 
the link um, and fill out the feedback form. The recording will be available. Um, that will be sent out uh, and uh, you'll get follow-up communication so you can access the recording. There are more webinars coming up. Uh, MHPN's three-day online conference from the 28th to the 30th of March. Um, I suspect that's actually passed. Um, altogether better. Um, I can't see my slide there. Where's it gone? Anyway, that's all right. Emerging Minds, the next webinars are being held in May and June. So there's decolonising mental health and working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and family. Wow, what a timely topic that one is, and also responding to childhood bullying, again, very important. So please keep an eye out for notifications for when you can register for these webinars or visit the upcoming webinar page on the MHPN website. And there's also the podcast program that releases episodes on a fortnightly basis. So we're a minute over time, but before I close, I would like to really thank the four people um, tonight. There have been comments saying it's the best panel we've ever had, and I'm up for that. There have been some beauties. Um, but before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the experience, people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you, everyone, for your participation this evening, and we all wish you the very best for your work going forward and for the evening ahead. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>